Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for gathering us to this space, to this sacred space. Calm down all that is bubbling within us and bring us into central focus. Help us to hear, help us to discern, and help us to receive a word from you. May you speak to the many. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to use for a sermon theme this morning, divine things, divine things. As it goes with college, there are lots of buildings, and we call them campuses. Um, in rural areas, there's generally one big campus, but sometimes in your urban context, you'll have a north campus, a south campus. It'll be split up by other city dwellings. Where I went to undergraduate school was in a rural area, and there were these buildings that were far apart, and the school was nice enough to build us cement paths that led from one building to another. But occasionally, students built another path, another path that they thought was quicker to get to the destination of A to B. And so you would see paths across the campus that were cement and meant to get us from one building to another. And then there would be these other paths where the grass was more or less had relented to the dirt under the feet of students who meant well. So there are well-traveled paths in life, and yet there are other paths less traveled, but traveled nonetheless. There are roads that many of us take to get to a destination, and then there are paths that only, only a few take. Yesterday and Friday, I attended the TPIRC Summit in Sycamore, Illinois. Talk about a path. Talk about a journey for a city dweller. I was in one group and we, we played this game. There were 12 people and a question was asked. There were 12 answers. The answer with the most number of people was the answer that would score the points. So in the group, when they asked a question, the question that got the most number of responses would be the winner. So for example, let me do this. Name a vegetable that begins with the letter C. Actually, you guys go ahead, yell out. Name a... I heard carrot. By the way, <laughs> yesterday in my group, 10 people out of the 12 named carrot. Yours truly said cucumber. I was shocked at all the people that named carrot. But the winners were, of course, the carrot people. They were the one that got the one point. But that wasn't the question that intrigued me. There was another question that was asked in this group. Your home is on fire, and you can only save one item from the home. What item would that be? So there were three people that said their phones. And then there were about three people that said their bag, their purse. And then there were a few more people that said their pictures. They would want to save their pictures. But there were only two people that named this last thing. I wonder if you can guess what it was. Anybody else? <laughs> oh, now I'm really in trouble. Any other guesses? The Bible. And I was shocked that only two out of 12 people said, house is on fire, that they would want to save the Bible. And this is where we enter the Bible or the biblical text today. Jesus prevents, presents a profound teaching that I believe posits that divine things are not found in the masses. They are not found in the majority answer. They are not found on paved and cemented roads. But divine things are found off the beaten path. Two roads diver diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference, says Robert Frost. Divine things refer to the thoughts, the values, and the actions that align with God's will, character, and purpose. This passage brings us face to face with the tension between human things and divine things. It is human to want to get to class as fast as we can, creating another path. 
When I looked at the GPS to Sycamore, Illinois, they gave me three choices. And under the first one, in italics, it said, fastest route. What do you think I took? It is human to want to get to our destination as quick as possible. It is human to want life to be quick and easy. It is human to not want to have to struggle. It is human to want what we want when we want it. It is human to think about our possessions when our house is on fire. It is human to preserve ourself. It is human to get caught up in the cares of this world. Jesus speaks not only of his coming suffering and death, but also of the cost of discipleship. The call to get this, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. In this text, Jesus draws a stark line between the natural human instinct that lives in us for self-preservation and the divine call to surrender to a will that is bigger than ourselves. And right away, Peter gets caught up in the human thing. He doesn't like what he is hearing. He loves the Jesus that heals and teaches and gives signs and makes the waves obey. He likes the Jesus who raises people from sickness and death. He's okay with Jesus who is going to restore Israel to its rightful place. Emerson B. Powery clarifies, for Peter and most Jews, Messiah refers to a militaristic political figure who would overthrow Rome's power and establish a new Davidic kingdom, which itself would inaugurate the kingdom of God. Such a divinely authorized figure could not be the one who would suffer and be killed. He was okay with the Christ, the Messiah, but this son of man talking about suffering? What is this suffering talk? There is so much suffering already in our world that it's hard to hear the text mention suffering. There are folks that are struggling. Some of you, if you keep it quite honest, are suffering already. There are folks that are dealing with some real stuff. I was listening to this lady this week talk about the struggle around her pregnancy. The, the doctor discovered that something was wrong with her fetus, but she lived in a state that did not allow her to have an abortion. So her and her husband worked on flying her to another state so she could then seek professionals in that state and have an abortion. She took the plane to this other state and she was in the room waiting. And while she was waiting for the visit, the fetus died. Now she had to go to the hospital. What stood out to me about her and as she was crying was her struggle. With resources, she had to leave her state without her husband to get services to end a dangerous pregnancy. If I took numbers, Many of you could talk about suffering, either that you're going through or someone you know in close proximity that you love. So all this talk about suffering is for the birds and the bees. As far as Peter and the disciples are concerned, we didn't, we, we, we didn't sign up for this. We signed up for the Messiah. Sometimes the path we sign on to has divine aspects we are not too keen on. Jesus talks about being the son of man and suffering. Jesus begins to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things, be rejected, killed, and then rise again. Nope, not interested. How many of you, not interested? Not interested. He asks us to deny ourselves and follow him. Not interested. Nope, still, still not interested. And finally, while you're at it, Get over there and pick up your cross. Whoa. In instances like this where the divine emphasizes suffering, I always think of our ancestors who suffered. One ancestor that comes to mind is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian, a pastor, and a theologian with strong convictions. 
He was someone who had escaped to the U.S. while the Holocaust was going on. He was safe here in the United States of America. And yet, as he followed Christ and Christ's teaching, and under the influence of Reinhold Niebuhr, he felt compelled to return home and stand in solidarity and resistance to the Nazi regime. He was hanged and killed one month before the Nazi regime was defeated. But his message and that of others could not be killed. This is definitely not the most traveled path. You're here, you're safe, and you go back? Jesus was drawing a line between this natural human instinct to save ourselves and the divine call to live for something bigger than ourselves. Now, maybe all of us can't be a Bonhoeffer or a Martin Luther King or a Mother Teresa, but for starters, we can understand what was harder for Peter to understand, the path that Jesus was on. I am here for a reason. I will be rejected and killed, but I, I will rise again. I will suffer, but that is not the end. My message will become stronger in the world. This is not a call to suffer, but it is a call to trust God's plan, to surrender and sacrifice and lean into God's plan. This is definitely the road less traveled. You don't have to worry about a crowd over here because there's no crowd on this path. It's lightly used, not much interest in putting oneself in harm's way. Malayla, a grown woman now desired an education in a Taliban-stricken country that did not believe in girls being educated, especially not Western education. She went to school even though it was dangerous. She began speaking out on her blog she began to get threats. The tension got bigger. The real thing is she could have stopped. The threats were on her life. That does it for most of us. You threaten our life, we'll shut up. <laughs> but Malayla and her dad found the courage not to be silenced. One day the Taliban gets on the bus with guns and they ask for Malayla. She identifies herself, and you guys have heard this story. They shot her at close range. The bullet hit her in the head. Divine things, human things. After rebuking Peter, Jesus expands his teaching to the crowd and says, if anyone would come, come after me, if anyone wants this thing, let that person deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Our natural human response is self-preservation. We cling to our lives. We cling to our plans. We cling to our comfort. We cling to our desire. We resist anything that threatens to take these things away. But Jesus says, whoever seeks to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for his sake will save it. Jesus relinquishes his life for a message that reaches us today. Bonhoeffer relinquished his life for a message that outlives him today. Malayla relinquished her life, gunshot at close range, for a message that surpasses her today. In God's plan, true life is found not in holding on, but in letting go. To follow Jesus, to relinquish our grip on our own lives, trusting that it's God's plan. We will find true life, even if it means suffering the road less travel. Divine things call us to trust God's plan over our own. Our intro today calling us to surrender, to follow, to check in, to ask God, what does God think? to check in, to have prayer, and say, what do you want, God? What, what do you want for my life today? What, where my, where my, my feet go today? Surrendering to God. It is not that we will suffer, but if the path leads that way, we will follow. And we may have to deny ourselves, but we will follow. 
And it may not be easy, but we will follow. And it may not be exactly convenient, but we will follow. And we will resist that urge to save just us, to save just our family, and trust that our lives, that this call to be followers of Christ can serve in the larger scheme of God's beloved community. Jesus invites us in this text today, and it's a hard invite to follow him. Divine things. Amen. <laughs>